Good morning, and thanks for joining us here today. I'm pleased to be here with Premier Kenny to discuss Alberta's economic statement and recovery plan. The Premier will provide more detail about our recovery plan in a few moments, but first I'd like to take uh, a few minutes and make some comments on the state of the provincial economy. This, this statement is a snapshot in time and is not a full economic update. We have data that shows the initial impact of COVID-19, but only time will reveal the full effect of the pandemic on Alberta's economy and its fiscal position. We do know the consequences will be extraordinary, and we plan to release a more fulsome economic and fiscal update later this summer. The effect of these events, sorry, the world changed in March when COVID-19 became a global pandemic and began to affect Alberta directly. Here in Alberta, we face dual crises. Not only did public health measures impact the economy, but a drastic decline in the, in the demand for oil and a global price war resulted in a remarkable collapse of world oil prices. The effect of these events will likely result in the most severe contraction of economic activity and employment since the Great Depression. Looking back, Alberta came into 2020 poised to turn the corner on years of economic pain, and we could see positive signs in the January and February year-over-year -year economic data. The energy sector was improving, with drilling up over 16% in January and over 11% in February, with rising production and increased capital investment. Alberta's agriculture sector was expected to fare better this year, and goods exports were up almost 20% in January and February, year over year. The real estate market was also improving with home sales, residential and commercial building permits all up year over year. Albertans were beginning to re-energize the economy and our province was set to reclaim our position as the top business destination in Canada. It's clear our economic policies were working and we were on track with a credible plan for a balanced budget within our three-year fiscal plan. COVID-19 changed all of that in a matter of weeks. Our government put necessary public health measures in place while working to keep as much of the economy open as possible. While some jurisdictions shut down completely, Albertans' responsible actions allowed us to keep our core sectors open. 85% of businesses continued operating, representing 96% of our GDP. Despite this, the impacts of the pandemic combined with the oil price crash have been severe. Business activity, energy investment, the labour market and real estate all show the wounds of this battle. Even with oil demand improving recently and OPEC extending its production cuts, the WTI oil price is down by almost 40% from where it was early in early 2020. Oil production fell 25% in the second quarter. The value of non-residential building permits, a leading indicator of construction activity, is down 25% in February. Retail sales have fallen by 30% and home sales by volume remain almost 40% lower compared to where they were in February. Most dramatically and sadly, more than 330,000 Albertans have lost their job. This amounts to the number of jobs Alberta's economy added over the last decade. The, unofficial, un, or, sorry, the official unemployment rate is 15.5%, but in actuality, because many have left the workforce, it's likely closer to 20%. These words are used often today, but it's no exaggeration to say that Alberta is facing a historic challenge, and the early economic indicators are supporting that assertion. That's why the Premier and I are here today to discuss Alberta's recovery plan. In the early days, the most pressing need was for liquidity or available credit as revenue streams shrunk or dried up altogether. Our supports, including dedicating $14 billion in relief and stimulus measures for Albertans and Alberta job creators. We waived workers' compensation board premiums for small and medium-sized businesses, offered a deferral on corporate taxes, and changed labour rules to help employers retain workers. We also provided funding for community initiatives and organizations like food banks whose supports were in greater demand. We deferred the tourism levy and enabled accommodation providers in the province to keep those dollars for the rest of the year as they worked to stay operational. For small and medium-sized enterprises who were required to close or severely curtail operations, we're providing grants of up to $5,000 to help them with the costs of reopening their doors. 
and we're supporting small businesses struggling to pay their rent through the Commercial Rent Assistance Program. We put these programs and others in place to assist our businesses and job creators through the toughest time in decades, but there's more. Our budget 2023 year fiscal plan committed 19.3 billion for building infrastructure. And we've expanded on that with additional investments over the three year plan to support immediate shovel worthy projects that will lay the foundation for future growth. They not only create jobs for the people who work on these projects, but they pave the way for future growth in our key sectors. Priority will be given to projects that improve our productivity and competitiveness and lead to increased private sector investment and job creation. Examples of these projects would be the twinning of highways and road repairs on important economic corridors, as well as health care facilities and essential utility infrastructure. Some of, uh, some of the other projects that will aid in our recovery include invest, investing $1.5 billion in the Keystone XL pipeline. The project is expected to directly and indirectly support 7,400 Canadian workers during construction and was a necessary investment to restart this project, a project that is critical to our province's economic future. We're creating more than 5,000 jobs immediately by accelerating capital maintenance and renewal funding for projects right across the province. And now today, we are ready to act with an even bolder plan. This province was built by its innovative, resourceful, and resilient citizens. And I know Albertans are ready to get back to work and build a new future. With that, I will turn things over to Premier Kenny for more detail on the other sweeping actions we will be taking to challenge, take on this challenge head on. I look forward to the work ahead. And while there will be challenges in the days to come, I'm confident our province will emerge from this crisis stronger than ever. Thank you. Premier Kenny. Thank you, Travis. Albertans are facing one of the most challenging times in our history. Over the past four months, we've been hit hard by the triple threat of the largest public health crisis in a century, the biggest global economic contraction since the 1930s, and an unprecedented collapse in energy prices. And all of that on top of five years of tough economic times. But through it all, Albertans have shown what we're made of. We are a resilient people, from the earliest days of the First Nations to the pioneers to generations of hardworking newcomers. Our history is one of emerging over adversity. As Alberta country star Brett Kissel, a fifth generation Alberta rancher sings, quotes, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Just think of how we've come through the COVID-19 pandemic. We've taken the path of personal responsibility, avoiding the kind of wide scale shutdowns and lockdowns imposed around the world. At the height of the pandemic, 85% of Alberta businesses, representing 96% of our economy, continued to operate safely. And we have safely relaxed public health restrictions more quickly and more broadly than any Canadian province. At the same time, we have amongst the lowest per capita levels of COVID infections, hospitalizations, and deaths in the Western world throughout the pandemic. That is a testament to the culture of personal responsibility and care for others that is hardwired into our province. It's also due to our culture of enterprise, from the brilliant public servants who started stockpiling the medical supplies before the world was aware of a pandemic, to lab scientists who planned ahead to deliver the highest per capita level of testing in the world, to the charities and businesses who found innovative ways of helping the vulnerable, to the countless random acts of kindness shown to neighbours and strangers alike. Albertans have risen to the challenge of the pandemic, and we will continue to be careful, especially for those who are most at risk. But now we must extend that same culture of resilience to overcoming the great economic challenge of our time. As I said at the outset, we must protect both lives and livelihoods. We are facing a real effective unemployment rate of perhaps as high as 25%. Far, far too many Albertans are out of work. Families are filled with anxiety about how they'll pay the mortgage and what the future holds. Tens of thousands of businesses are struggling to survive right now, to make the next payroll, to cover the rent. 
New graduates are wondering if there is a place for them in Alberta's economy. Our future is truly at stake. Alberta's government has acted in unprecedented ways to protect people through the worst of the crisis. We provided some $14 billion in support, more than any other province on a relative basis, including over half a billion dollars for our health care system, support for long-term care homes and those who work in them, emergency isolation payments so that sick workers could stay at home, up to $200 million in small business relaunch grants for those uh, businesses that had to close. And let me say that applications for that program went live online uh, an hour ago at Your Alberta. Support for homeless shelters, women's shelters, and food banks. Over $50 million in COVID-related mental health support for those struggling to cope, and that's more than the mental health support from all other provinces combined. 40 million free masks to help contain the spread. Funding to help daycare operators reopen, which in turn helps a lot of parents get back to work. Deferrals on utility bills, education property taxes, student loans, and government fees. Access to credit for struggling employers and policies to protect both renters and commercial tenants. But much more needs to be done in the long journey to economic recovery that lies ahead. Today, we take a big step forward in that journey with the launch of Alberta's recovery plan, a bold, ambitious, long-term strategy to build, to diversify, and to create jobs. It's a plan for today that provides hope for the future. We've developed this plan with input from Alberta's Economic Recovery Council, chaired by one of Canada's most highly regarded economists, Dr. Jack Mintz, and including many of Alberta's prominent leaders in business, labor, and public service, including the Right Honorable Stephen Harper, who successfully led Canada through the global financial crisis. Thank you to the members of the Council and so many others who've contributed their time and expertise. This strategy builds on Alberta's enormous strengths. Alberta has the youngest and best educated population in Canada. We've been bestowed with some of the most valuable natural resources on the face of the earth, many of which we've not even begun to develop. Alberta has the lowest taxes in Canada. We have vibrant historic industries like agriculture, a thriving innovation sector, a world-class tourism experience, and dynamic creative industries. In other words, we are a diversified economy, much more diversified today than we were in decades past. And most importantly, Albertans have an irrepressible entrepreneurial culture. We are by nature builders, dreamers, and doers. Alberta's recovery plan builds on those and other strengths with timely targeted investments and bold policy reforms that will create tens of thousands of jobs right now, make Alberta more competitive in the long term, accelerate economic diversification in industries of the future, ensure a strong future for the bedrock sector of our economy, Alberta's innovative energy industry, and immediately show investors around the world that we really do mean business. It's about building, diversifying, and most importantly, creating jobs. This recovery plan will create tens of thousands of jobs and make our economy more productive in the long run with the largest infrastructure build in Alberta history with $10 billion in projects that will move people from unemployment to good jobs right now, building roads, bridges, overpasses, water projects, pipelines, gas lines, schools, hospitals, long-term care homes for seniors, drug treatment centers for those struggling with addiction, tourism infrastructure, and much more. This will spur the creation of, we estimate, uh, 50,000 jobs and other knock-on jobs through subcontractors and suppliers, small businesses, hotels, and restaurants in every corner of the province. This, the largest infrastructure build in Alberta history, and by far the largest in the country on a per capita basis, represents about a 40% increase over what had initially been budgeted in the province's uh, capital plan for this fiscal year. 
we will immediately accelerate the job creation tax cut to give Alberta by far the most attractive environment for new business investment in Canada and amongst the lowest rates in all of North America, moving the general business tax rate from the current 10% to 8% this week on July the 1st. This will accelerate the creation of an estimated 55,000 jobs, new full-time private sector jobs, and stimulate, we estimate, $13 billion in economic growth. We will launch the Innovation Employment Grant, an exciting new incentive to create high-paying jobs by making Alberta the most attractive place in Canada to invest in the critical technology and innovation sector industries of the future. To support those industries, we will also invest an additional $175 million into the Alberta Enterprise Corporation to expand access to venture capital for early stage startup companies. We will create Investment Alberta, a new provincial agency that will lead an aggressive worldwide campaign to attract job creating investment retooling and expanding our network of international offices while providing concierge service to prospective investors and telling institutional investors the truth about Alberta's environmental responsible energy sector. Of course, we've already been doing that promotion. Just this morning, I was uh, on the phone with major investors in the United Arab Emirates and others about the possibility of massive in capital investment in petrochemical diversification here in Alberta. We will create 7,400 jobs by moving forward with construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, thanks to Alberta's $1.5 billion preferred equity investment in this critical project. We will put Albertans first for available jobs by asking the federal government to remove most occupational categories under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program for Alberta, while helping to connect employers to unemployed Albertans making job training programs more responsive and accelerating the Fairness for Newcomers Action Plan. Due to the impairment of international travel and the deep jobs crisis, we'll also reduce by at least one third uh, the number of certificates to be issued under the Alberta Immigration Nominee Program this year, while moving ahead with key platform commitments to modernize our immigration program, like the Foreign Graduate Startup Visa Program, to support growth in the tech and innovation sectors. We will accelerate the future of the natural gas industry and a retooled program to incentivize potentially tens of billions of dollars of investment in the petrochemical sector, which will add value to our natural resources. We will implement sector-specific strategies to drive diversification, including in agriculture and forestry, tourism, technology and innovation, aviation, finance and fintech or financial technology, and creative industries. Work is well advanced on each of these sector strategies and they will be released in the weeks to, and months to come. We will create a cultural event relaunch program to support music, performing arts, and landmark cultural events, which have been especially hard hit by public health measures. And that's important because one of our great advantages is our quality of life and our creative industries are a key part of that. We will amend the Alberta Re Labor Relations Code to further cut red tape that impedes job creation. These and many other measures will complement dozens of pro-growth policies already being implemented as part of the province's blueprint for jobs. That includes the Red Tape Reduction Initiative. Uh, there will be an update uh, later in the summer, but we've made great progress towards our goal of a one-third reduction in the number of job-killing regulatory requirements imposed by Alberta's government and to speed up approval so that we become the freest and fastest moving economy in North America. And it also includes the Skills for Jobs Plan to promote apprenticeships and experiential learning uh, and to make sure that Albertans are ready to seize the jobs of the future. Alberta's recovery plan is a work in progress. Details of each policy initiative will be released in the days and weeks to come. But given the severity of the economic crisis, we must act now. The plan offers clear directions as, as clear direction as government continues to consult Albertans and finalize policy work in some areas like the sectoral growth strategies. Altogether, 
this plan represents a bold statement of confidence in the future of Alberta. It is based on common sense, not ideology. It balances targeted government spending in areas like job creating infrastructure with strong incentives for private sector growth like the accelerated job creation tax cut and the expanded red tape reduction initiative. It takes immediate short-term action to create jobs while preparing us for the long-term future. It ensures a future for our largest industry, oil and gas, while boosting diversification in key growth sectors like tech and innovation through the new Innovation Employment Grant and the Alberta Enterprise Corporation. For those rightly concerned about the province's fiscal future, Minister Tays will be tabling a frank update on the province's finances later this summer. Albertans will have tough choices to make about how to get our finances back in order. But right now, in the face of the deepest job crisis in nearly a century, we must prudently leverage the province's balance sheet to build, to diversify, and to create jobs. If we don't get people back to work, if we don't restore investor confidence and get our economy growing again, the fiscal challenge will become insurmountable. Jobs and the economy must come first. Under Alberta's recovery plan, jobs and the economy do come first. Our plan will mean job creation now, starting this week, and it will put Alberta on a plan for a generation of growth. Just as Albertans have pulled together to flatten the curve and to save lives, we must now show the same spirit of resilience and enterprise to save livelihoods, to recover, to grow, and to thrive as a province once again. And with that, uh, Travis and I are happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Premier. Uh, a reminder to folks online to please push star one to enter the queue. Um, and with that, we'll take your first question. First is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. James Keller with the Globe and Mail, please go ahead. We don't hear James here. No, his line is open. James, you can check if your phone is on mute. Maybe we should come back to James. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think we will. Our next is David Staples with the Edmonton Journal. Go ahead, David. Hi, Mr. Premier. I'm curious about the immigration piece. I don't quite understand it. Um, it sounded to me like you're kind of, you're cutting back on one type of immigrant and moving towards uh, more people in the foreign workers program. So is, is that understanding no. that I'm having correct? No, that's uh, incorrect. In fact, uh, first of all, uh, Minister of Labor and Immigration, Jason Copping will be uh, presenting all the details of these changes uh, likely next week. Uh, but let me say, what we're doing is, first of all, exercising our uh, power under the uh, Temporary Foreign Worker Annex to the uh, Alberta-Canada Agreement on Immigration Cooperation, which allows us to identify uh, certain occupational categories uh, for not to be processed uh, for labor market impact assessments for the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. I know that's a lot of technical language, but what it effectively means is we're asking Ottawa uh, not to process applications for temporary foreign workers. Uh, in It will be in a range of dozens of occupational categories, the vast majority of occupational categories. Uh, for a and, and the reason for this is because, as I've said, we're facing a real unemployment rate of between 20 and 25% across all ages and skill levels. And it is uh, extremely difficult for me to justify uh, employers looking outside Alberta to bring people in to a la labor market in the midst of an unprecedented crisis. So what we are doing is, is, is telling employers uh, at, in the vast majority of occupations that they will not, for the time being, be able to access the temporary foreign worker program. There will be some uh, ex exceptions to this, in particular uh, areas where there ha have been 
long-term and, and, and clearly proven uh, uh, dis discrete skill shortages. I'll give you one example. Uh, advanced meat cutters in meatpacking plants. Uh, but we want to address those challenges by set setting up uh, targeted training programs, working with those employers, and if ne as necessary, to offer incentives for Albertans to get trained up and fill those jobs um, uh, right now. Uh, and so there will be uh, some um, a gradual implementation of this in areas like, for example, agricultural occupations. But in areas like, for example, the, the, the single largest uh, in, uh, sector, which has uh, used the uh, TFW program in the past, has been uh, the hospitality sector, um, uh, for example, at restaurants. And we just simply, you know, with tens of thousands of young people and, and restaurant workers out of work, we just cannot justify uh, using having the government use, or the employers use the TFW program. So it's, it's effectively largely a suspension of the TFW program that we will be implementing through our authority under the Canada-Alberta uh, Cooperation Agreement. On immigration, when I, the difference is TF, t temporary foreign workers come in on work permits, temporary residents. Immigration deals with people who arrive or get permanent residency, which is a path, of course, to citizenship. And uh, Alberta has the immigrant nominee program. Uh, the federal government gives us uh, as many as 6,250 certificates that we can issue to people uh, to get permanent residency uh, to stay in Alberta. Uh, what we're saying is that because of the effective collapse of international travel, uh, there, there's really no way that we can hit that target. And secondly, uh, we also think it's prudent to reduce the number of certificates that we will issue under the immigrant nominee program uh, we'll be going from 6,250 6, to no more than 4,000 uh, this year um, for a number of obvious reasons. Uh, one, people can't come here in any event. Secondly, they would be coming, in most cases, to face unemployment. Thirdly, the uh, data and research is very clear that newcomers who arrive in the midst of a serious recession do much less well throughout their entire lives in Canada than those who arrive during periods of economic growth. So I don't think we would be doing anybody a favor to bring them into an incredibly tough labor market. We instead want to focus on getting Albertans, including the newest Albertans who have only recently immigrated here, we want to connect them with uh, available jobs. Uh, and so for all of those, and, and I would just say that this is a conventional response to deep downturns in the mid-1970s and the early 1980s, uh, Pierre Trudeau's government uh, significantly cut immigration targets uh, because of uh, double-digit unemployment. So we think this is the right thing to do for newcomers, for our broader economy. It's also, frankly, um, just a reflection of the reality that people are not traveling in any event. What, one last nuance, I'm sorry for the long answer, but it is a complex area. Uh, one last nuance is we are committing to moving forward with the Alberta Advantage immigration strategy reforms that were outlined in our platform last year. This was, by the way, by far the most detailed immigration platform ever presented in an Alberta election. And that includes a couple of very important programs to stimulate uh, job creating growth in the technology and innovation sectors. Uh, like, for example, the, um, I mentioned the startup visa. Uh, and, uh, and one of the biggest problems in our tech sector is a lack of uh, people with relevant skills, uh, something we obviously hope to develop through training programs here in Alberta, uh, but we also want to encourage uh, folks who are going to do startup enterprises to move to Alberta to create jobs. That program, so we're not shutting down immigration. We're going to maintain uh, our immigration program at, at somewhat reduced levels given the economic crisis, and we're going to focus more on folks who will come here and start businesses, for example, in the tech sector. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Rick Bell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister Taves. A question for the Premier. Um, Two-parter. One, part one is, I understand how there'll be lots of construction jobs with this um, infrastructure build. How is this going to help uh, fill the downtown offices in Calgary? How is this going to help people who do have jobs, but they've seen their hours cut or they've, or they've seen their pay cut, so they're still working, and they're not in the construction business? Um, I ask that question because 
the city of Calgary has done a mini version of this, and we still have the downtown offices at 27% vacant. And the second question is, what does this do to the province's finances? Because I realize there's been a huge change since you ran last year and won, but what does this do to the province's debt, et cetera? I realize there's a frank update later, but what does it do to the the state of the province's finances sure. that you're going to be having to spend quite a bit more money. I'll take the first one and uh, hand the finance question to the finance minister. Um, Rick, first of all, we estimate that the record $10 billion build program uh, for infrastructure will create something like 50 thousand jobs right now this year good paying jobs and it will also create jobs uh, secondary jobs if you will by filling up hotels and getting workers in in, in, in restaurants and communities all across the province so the service sector suppliers vendors um, it, it will be uh, you know I, I was just coming in here to McDougal Center this morning and uh, much of the uh, front area is closed off because they're relaying the 35-year-old brickwork here. That's part of our billion-dollar cap or surge in capital maintenance and renewal spending. And those workers are going across the street and, and buying their lunch at Tim Hortons and whatnot. So, I mean, that is one of the ways we're going to get the broader economy moving. Secondly, with respect to the office towers in downtown Calgary, uh, that's exactly what we are talking about with accelerating the implementation of the job creation tax cut, that one-third reduction in the tax burden on employers, uh, which is estimated over its life, uh, over four years to create 55,000 new private sector full-time jobs. And we think that is our biggest um, ace in the hole when it comes to attracting new businesses to populate these uh, vacant downtown Calgary and Edmonton office towers. Uh, you know, this the announcement today sends a startling message to business leaders across Canada and throughout North America that our commitment to have the lowest taxes for job creators isn't just some aspirational out there in the future uh, BS target. It's real and it's right now. Other governments in Canada committed to lower business taxes, but then they pulled back because they, they, they didn't have the grit to do it. Today, we're demonstrating that this is not talk. We are walking the walk right now, Wednesday, July 1st. Canada, uh, Alberta's provincial income uh, tax rate for businesses will be um, uh, four points lower than the next highest province. And so, we <laughs> secondly... We're, we're, we're launching a new investment promotion agency, and I will be sending them out there to Bay Street, uh, to uh, downtown Montreal, to Houston, where we'll be setting up an office, to New York and elsewhere, to sell this message of the tax differential and so many other benefits, including inexpensive AAA rental space available right here in a city that has been vo voted as having the best, most livable city in North America three straight years by The Economist magazine. So that uh, investment promotion agency is going to have an amazing story to tell. They will be proactive. They're going to go out there uh, and um, make sure that companies know that I think they're being irresponsible if they don't consider moving operations to Alberta. Thirdly, uh, the uh, Innovation uh, Jobs Grant will give Alberta the strongest incentives for tech and innovation companies to move to and to set up shop here in Alberta. That will be supported by access to ad additional venture capital through the $175 million uh, additional investment in the Al Alberta Enterprise Corporation. It will be start supported by smart uh, labor market programs like the startup visa that we, whose, whose uh, implementation we're going to accelerate, all of these things together send a clear message. If you want to start up, a, a, do a tech startup, do it in downtown Edmonton or, or do it in, in another community in, in, in Alberta. You're going to benefit from the strongest incentives and more details will follow on that program. And then finally, uh, the sectoral strategies that we'll be releasing, including, on, for example, on, now, just hear me now, Rick. Fi like, I don't think any Alberta government has ever talked about this before, but we are going to be placing a huge 
emphasis on finance and financial technology, fintech. What, what do you think we're going after? Well, all of those banks and insurance companies down on Bay Street that are paying way more taxes, their workers are paying way more taxes, they are paying way more for rent, they're fighting Toronto traffic, we're going to be telling them that they can save money for their shareholders, for their workers, for their operations, by relocating uh, financial and fintech jobs to places like downtown Calgary, downtown Edmonton. So I would say the economic recovery plan is very focused on that. On the fiscal question, I'll, I'll uh, hand you over to Travis. Great. Thanks, Premier. And thanks for that question, Rick. Um, firstly, I would say this. Uh, ultimately, our plan here today uh, continues in the direction that we laid out in Budget 2019 and Budget 2020. As you recall, uh, our plan to balance the budget, it was a very credible plan, uh, was ensuring that we were delivering government in the most efficient manner possible and at the same time growing uh, our economic capacity and basically growing the economy in the, in the province, which leads to additional, obviously, job creation and opportunities for Albertans, but, it, uh, but an, uh, increased government revenues as well. So that, that remains our plan, and, and this economic recovery plan that we're rolling out today is consistent with that. So in fact, our, our goal of delivering the most efficient government remains a goal today. And we intend to, uh, to double down on that in the, in the weeks, months, and even years ahead to ensure that we're delivering responsibly on behalf of Albertans. But at the same time, we need to grow our economy. And I mean, COVID-19 is much more than just a speed bump along the road here. This is, this is, a, this is an incredible um, ditch that we have to get through. And so it warrants um, a significant investment uh, to ensure that uh, we're positioned well for, for the recovery. So that's why uh, our, our enhanced infrastructure projects will be projects that will in fact improve our competitive, competitiveness, improve our productivity, lead to increased private sector investment and job creation and economic growth in the province in the intermediate and longer term. Uh, again, in order to, uh, to deliver uh, responsible fiscal management, we have to deliver uh, efficiently and grow our economy. I'm, I'm going to characterize it this way, uh, Rick. You know what? Uh, and every, you know, every person who manages a household gets this. Uh, there's good debt and bad debt. Um, we need to deliver efficient government because that's, you know, as we borrow to deliver government programs, that's like racking up debt on a credit card. Whereas our investments are key investments in solid defensible infrastructure projects that will lead to further private sector investment and growth. That's like uh, borrowing uh, on a house or on real property. That's good debt. We are right now making some investments that will result in some additional good debt, but most importantly, uh, it will expand our, our capacity, our economy, and again, create opportunity for Albertans. Thank you, Minister. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Sorry about that. Uh, two questions about the impact uh, on the province's finances in two areas. Um, whether the risk to the province's credit rating could increase borrowing costs for these big infrastructure projects, and on accelerating the corporate tax cut, uh, how much of a hit do you expect to take on those revenues, and what will the impact be on the deficit uh, that you expect this year and in subsequent years? Okay, you were a little hard to hear, James. Um, on uh, so, in, in terms of the second question, that was the impact. Um, of the job create the accelerated job creation tax cut uh, on on our current um, government government revenues. Uh, if I've understood that one correctly, uh, I'll answer that one first, and you'll have to repeat the first one. I just couldn't make it out. So, uh, in the current fiscal year that we're in, um, effective July one, re uh, reducing our rate from ten to eight percent uh, will uh, affect government revenues uh, between uh, two hundred and three hundred million dollars in the current year. That's uh, that is the estimate that we have. Uh, next year, again, because we were going to be at, at 9% and in fact are at 8%, uh, the estimated effect is between $100 and $200 million. So uh, again, what we want to do, to, to the Premier's point, we really want to send a message uh, to, to the business community, to the investment community that Alberta is open for business. We're doubling down on ensuring we have the most competitive business environment possible uh, and we know that will lead to increased investment. But James, can you repeat that first question? Yeah, the first question, if you can hear me now, was uh, is there any risk uh, of the province's credit rating being downgraded and that sort of increasing borrowing costs substantially? 
Well, you, you know, the reality, James, in this environment, uh, I, I suspect um, most provincial governments, we've even seen it with our federal government, uh, we, we run the risk of, of future downgrades. There's no doubt about it. But, and, and again, I'm going to be pleased to present uh, a full fiscal update uh, later on in the summer. But the reality is this. Uh, because of the uh, serious economic downturn uh, and, and, of course, the oil price crash, um, our government will be foregoing billions of dollars in revenue this year uh, just a result of reduced economic activity. And that's why we, we believe it's critically important to roll out this economic recovery plan proactively, which, again, is, is um, very intentional investments uh, in infrastructure and, uh, and, and as well, uh, ensuring that uh, we have a very competitive uh, business environment with other provinces, with other jurisdictions in the area of tech and innovation. All right. Thanks, Minister. Uh, we have time for about three more questions. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Tony Seskos with CBC. Go ahead, Tony. Yes, yeah, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, there was hope amongst uh, Alberta tech entrepreneurs that there was going to be uh, news perhaps on, uh, on uh, maybe bringing back or or having something like the Alberta Investment Tax Credit or the Digital Media Tax something Credit. I'm wondering if, if there was any consideration to that. I didn't hear that today. Uh, and then why, you know, if, if there is any, why not? Well, there is, in fact. Uh, we, we are announcing today that we will be creating an innovation uh, jobs grant that will be the most attractive incentive for job creation in the tech and innovation sector in Canada. Um, and uh, this is coming out of the report of the uh, Innovation Capital Working Group, which we'll be releasing shortly. Uh, this effectively replaces the previous uh, investment tax credit and the uh, shred credit, which uh, we sunsetted in uh, this, uh, this past year's budget. Um, because we didn't think they were working uh, effectively. You know, the Alberta Investment Tax Credit uh, had only been used by, I understand, less than 200 businesses in Alberta, none of them profitable, and uh, it, was a, uh, it was a burdensome application-based program uh, with a very limited number of businesses that, uh, that benefited. Uh, whereas the, uh, this grant that we are rolling out now will be a much, much stronger invest, uh, incentive for growth in the sector. We've road tested the concept uh, with members of the uh, Innovation Capital Working Group and other folks in tech and innovation, and uh, we believe they are very excited about this new program. We're not releasing all of the details yet, and uh, it, this is, I should also point out, in addition to $175 million uh, investment in the Alberta Enterprise Corporation, uh, to accelerate uh, the startup tech sector here through more availability of venture capital. The two biggest problems the tech sector has in Alberta, one, a lack of venture capital. We're addressing that through the uh, uh, Alberta uh, Enterprise Corporation investment. And the second is uh, availability of people with relevant skills, and we're addressing that through the acceleration of the startup visa launch. But I'll invite Travis to say a few more words about the uh, tech jobs grant. Sure, good. Thanks, Premier. So the um, uh, I innovation employment grant uh, is really going to, as the Premier noted, is uh, is going to provide uh, exponential incentive uh, to to grow here in the province, and so uh, it, it will provide uh, reward growth in a, in a much more significant way than the shred credit um, did. And for the other credits, such as uh, the Alberta Investment uh, Tax Credit and, and others, so those credits uh, programs were application-based, full of red tape. Uh, they created, um, you know, a lot of costs for companies to comply, a lot of costs for government governments to administer. And, uh, and this program that we're rolling out uh, is much more efficient. And uh, again, it encourages employment growth in the province. It actually dovetails very nicely with our preferential uh, corporate tax rate or business tax rate because it begins to phase out um, for, uh, as companies start to uh, get phased out of the small business uh, deduction uh, category and are, and are paying uh, a higher corporate rate, which of course we've brought down. So the two programs uh, will dovetail very well. Uh, thank you. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Can I just, before that question, I'll just say um, that there will be more details to follow. We'll be making a, 
uh, detailed uh, launch on that policy uh, in the days to come. All right, next is Bill Fortier with CTV News. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Uh, one quick question for the uh, Finance Minister, one for the Premier. For the Finance Minister, can you provide us with a breakdown of the, the total cost of all of these programs announced today? Um, how much of that will come, if any, from cutting other programs, and how much of it will come from borrowing, and what's the actual number of the deficit? What does that do to the deficit? From the Premier, you talk about investing investment. Uh, who do you think is investing right now? Like what industry, the whole world's been hit by this global pandemic and the economic hardship. Who do you see investing or looking to invest right now? Okay, so, so in terms of the uh, cost of the announcements today, uh, the actual cash cost uh, of the announcements, of the incremental announcements today, because we're also identifying a whole series of programs and investments that started with Budget 2020 and then subsequent announcements um, from the time COVID started until today. The incremental cost, uh, uh, dollar cost of the uh, announcements today is just over uh, $2 billion. And again, uh, uh, the majority of that is actual investment. In other words, it doesn't directly hit, hit the FISC. For uh, infrastructure invest investments, uh, for instance, uh, we'll be inv investing in additional transportation corridors, and of course, um, the treatment of, those, of that is in fact to, to write off those investments at about 4% per year uh, as they expire and as they depreciate. Uh, so uh, a direct cost, uh, of course, would be uh, our uh, innovation employment grant. We expect the cost of that program to be in the neighborhood of $60 million, which is less actually than, than our uh, shred our previous shred credit was, but again, this program is much more targeted to uh, startups and to early scale-up companies. These are companies that are, are pre-revenue uh, and, and certainly pre-profit, and that's why it's going to be a, a refundable credit so that, in fact, companies in that category uh, can benefit. Uh, the investment in, in the Alberta Enterprise Corporation is just that. It's an investment. So we're going to be recapitalizing that fund. That it doesn't, well, it, it will take some cash, uh, it does not directly hit the FISC. Uh, we actually expect a return out of those funds. And good, good question about uh, who's investing now. Well, you know, let me just say that uh, Alberta had uh, uh, the least stringent public health restrictions of any province in Canada. Uh, we now have had the widest and fastest reopening uh, following the peak of the pandemic. And so some of the comparative data is actually, I think, somewhat encouraging. We've seen, for example, on credit card billings and recent uh, StatsCan numbers on uh, retail sales that Alberta has been less hard hit than other provinces, notwithstanding the double whammy of the energy price collapse here. So uh, we are uh, hopeful about seeing a return to economic growth as demand returns uh, as we hopefully move past uh, the, the worst of the pandemic. Secondly, um, I can tell you that the, the, a lot of the investments that are already being made are uh, resulting in job creation now. Travis and I just visited this morning uh, Atco Structures, great Alberta company, uh, where they have gone from uh, 32 employees in their plant in central Calgary to 380 employees. They've just moved uh, operations from Idaho to here because of our competitive advantage, and they believe in if they in principle, they would like to add a second shift that would hire hundreds more workers in good paying jobs here in Alberta. And guess what they're making those trailers for? They're making them for the Coastal Gas Link project and the Trans Mountain expansion. And who knows, maybe they'll also be making them for Keystone XL. So that just shows you the kind of investments that are being made, for example, in energy that have spin-offs, investing in manufacturing and value added. Third point I would make is this. Um, We've gotten some really great advice from the members of Alberta's Economic Recovery Council, some of the uh, brightest minds in the province. And a number of those folks have said to us that right now, major companies across Canada and around the world are taking a step back because of COVID to assess all of their operations, uh, their cost structure, where, their, their workplace environment, where they locate their employees, how they do their work. And they are, uh, we've been told by a number of these major business leaders that a lot of large employers are 
are doing a fundamental reassessment of their footprint, their location, their tax burden, the competitiveness of different jurisdictions. In other words, um, things get shaken up by a crisis. COVID is a huge crisis, and it will shake up where businesses locate and how they operate. That's why we're trying to get in front of those decision makers who are responsible for the uh, locating hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. We're trying to get in front of them now. Now, uh, this big push for investment doesn't mean we're going to get a, a bunch of positive announcements in the next few weeks. This is setting us up for big decisions that will be made in the months to come for 2021, 22, and 23. I'll give you one example. I've spent a lot of my time working on a major multinational uh, to uh, secure potential $10 billion capital investment in petrochemicals east of Edmonton. But based on their timeline, they would not make a final investment decision till probably 2023. But the work we do now um, will set us up, hopefully, for a positive decision then. So a lot of this, this is about preparing the groundwork. All right, folks, thank you so much. That's all we have time for here today. All right, thank you for the good questions.